everyone. It's John Rocha here for the Outlaw Nation. Really excited to be interviewing director Rick Roman Waugh here about his latest film, Kandahar. You know Rick's work. If you haven't known Rick's work, you need to know Rick's work. I mean, Angel has fallen, Greenland, Shock Collar, and Snitch. And that's just a few of the great projects he's been involved in. And this one is a fantastic film starring Gerard Butler that explores, I mean, an, an area of the world that I think a lot of people don't know that much about. And the film does incredible justice while also being this fantastic thriller. So welcome to the Outlaw Nation, Rick Roman. Well, how are you, brother? Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You, you're most welcome. The first thing I want to ask you about, first, let me give you a little background, everybody who's watching right now. Uh, Tom Harris is the character, the main character, that's who Jar Butler is playing. He's an undercover CIA operative who's stuck deep in hostile territory in Afghanistan, and he has to go through all these obstacles along with his uh, partner and interpreter, uh, Navid Nagaban, that's who the actor is, to get out of this situation. And it's a two-hour film. Rick, uh, talk to me about what appealed to you about this particular movie and this story here uh in the film well i met mitch lafartoon the writer yes while doing greenland and i'm a huge veteran supporter and i found out about him being in the dia you know the defense intelligence agency yeah. and he'd been stationed overseas for over a decade and i found out about this was his first script that he had wrote and our producer basil iwanek had told us told me about it mm. This is the man that made Sicario. And yeah. so when I found out it was inspired by true events, but it has had this unique lens, I read it and I knew exactly what Basil was talking about. The way Sicario took you into the drug war yeah. in a very different way and humanized both sides of it so that you understood the stakes of it while giving you that great big action ride. That's what Kandahar does in the Middle East. It doesn't give you just the Western point of view and everybody in the Middle East are cardboard cutouts that live there. It shows you all aspects of it, and it shows you why the cycle of violence continues and how who could be your ally today could be your adversary tomorrow. But, you know, the hard part of these things, John, is not becoming a documentarian, right? Mm. It's about the balance of giving you enough context to get you to understand who the players are and that just like us, and we might not like our politics there are people in other countries that might not like the politics of their country, but they're ordered to enforce it, you know, in a military way or a police way, but they're just trying to get home to their families just like us, you know, and that there's real human stakes and real costs. So wrapping it in that big action ride like that, but giving you the emotional connection to it, I mean, it just spoke to me. I mean, in, in the first reading, I was in 100%. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Mitchell does an incredible job with the writing here. I think you uh, absolutely nailed it. Sicario is my favorite film of 2015, and I thought it was a criminal yes. that it wasn't nominated for Best Picture, and it's still one I go back to and watch. And you're absolutely right. This film ha is like a cousin of Sicario or brother of yes. Sicario from the vibe and the nature of it all and showing you the multiple perspectives, whether it's uh, Pakistan, whether it's Iraq, whether it's ISIS or Taliban or the United States or a reporter. Like, there's so many different points of views here and you take the time in this film to show the complexity of each point of view so this could have defaulted in very simply into america hero everybody else bad mm -hmm. as you mentioned earlier so this it's so fantastic to hear that this is something that really appealed to you in terms of how you presented it um how did you pitch this to gerard butler you know you've worked with him a couple of times before already was this something he immediately jumped at or was there more matter was there fear about wading into a politically fraught situation with a film like this well, the one thing that Jerry knows is... Oh, Jerry. You know, oh, excuse me, Jerry. Well, yeah, yeah. well <laughs> the, and trust me, I'm not that special. Everybody around <laughs> Gerard Butler calls him Jerry. He's just Fair such enough. a grounded, warm human being, you know, and yeah. he's just he's just the one of us, right? And that's yeah. what appeals to people on screen is that he doesn't come off fictional or fake or trying to put on something. He just is who he is. And I love that. He's, yeah. he's comfortable in his own skin. He knows that I don't like to cast my own opinion in movies. So if I'm going into the prison world... I'm not going to tell you how to what prison reform looks like. Right. I'm going to show you what it is, warts and all, so that you can form your own opinion, what's going on. And when I read Kandahar, coming off of Angel Has Fallen Together, where we took a guy that he was tired of playing that was would kill 50 bad guys and not even have a scratch on him, yeah. we wanted to humanize a Secret Service agent and show the cost of how we all try to outdo our own mortality, right? And so here's now he's come a pill popping, you know, Secret Service agent, you know, not trying to hang up the gun and keep it going. And what are the ramifications of that? Just as much as an, an athlete or anybody else. Yeah. Then we took him into Greenland and made him the mortal. 
no special skills. All he had was his heart and his own morality about how far you would go to survive and protect your family at the same time from life or death. Kanhar puts it all together. And so when I read it, I, you know, Basil and I talked and he goes, so who do you think? I go, come on, you know exactly who you think. And he goes, I know, I just wanted you to say it. I'm like, I'm calling Jerry right now. And I called him and I said, like, we're fans of the searchers. We're fans of the movies of the fifties through the seventies, where they were real human beings. They had flaws. They were dealing with real things, but what is that kind of big epic landscape that we can play on? I was like, you need to read this. Just trust me on this. And he literally read it that night, called me and goes, I get it. I know exactly what you're talking about. And we were off to the races. And, you know, the, the thing that was interesting, and sometimes you got to be careful what you ask for. Yeah. But I told Basil, I go, I'm not going to New Mexico or something like that. I'm not shooting a Middle East movie in the U.S. I need to be in the region. If we want authenticity, we need to be authentic. Yeah. And he said, well, it just so happens Saudi Arabia is looking to get into the film business. And that's what exactly happened. We were the first major motion picture from Hollywood to shoot in Saudi Arabia since Lawrence of Arabia. So that undertaking was extraordinary. Like we were mounting their infrastructure, doing everything. But what you got is a way to not show how the last 20 years of movies have showed the Middle East where it's dirty, desaturated, grim. I wanted to show like what Stephen McCurry showed in photo photographs of the Middle East, that that beautiful landscape, those yeah. epic blue skies, the the primary colors of of the of the region itself so that it looked beautiful and stunning but also showed you the humanity of the region and yeah. really tap into that of all sides and and not glorify death right not not make it a gratuitous so if somebody dies and they should die then good you know like we're, we're we understand that death but other people that we suddenly go wait a minute that's supposed to be an antagonist and i'm feeling empathy for them what the heck's going on here and that's what i wanted to play with yeah, it's fantastic. You challenged the viewer in that way, and I really appreciated that about your film. Because as I said, it can become cartoon character stuff sometimes with 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 uh, uh, subject material like this, and you didn't do that. And I think you deserve all the credit in the world for you and Mitchell Thank doing you. that in this film, for sure, honestly. Now, you do some incredible direction here with the action sequences. I mean, we've seen you with Greenland, and we know how crazy you can get. We've seen with action uh, with uh, London's <laughs> phone where you can go with that stuff. But there's a fantastic scene late in the film between Gerard Butler and, and Navi where they discuss their lives and i'm not going to give anything away it's no spoiler here but that is so touching and poignant and it plays out later with certain things that happen and certain people they encounter how important is it for you as a director to really nail those emotional stakes in those scenes to balance the fantastic action sequences that you can shoot so well thank you i think it's there's twofold there one why that scene is so pivotal is when I met a number of guys that had done a lot of prison time mm. and they come out and they try to tell their families what that experience was, they'll never understand it because they weren't of like mind or of like experience. And yeah. it's no different from the veteran, right? The veteran, the only way a veteran can really share their trauma or whatever happened in theater is of people of like mind, of like experience. And that's the interesting thing about this portrayal is you have two men from opposite sides of the planet and yet, because of the cycle of war, they realize they have more in common than they do with their own families. And that's a that's a really powerful thing that a lot of people relate to that have been to war, have been in these type of traumatic situations, even if it's not war. For me, action is the sake of action, unless there's an emotional attachment to it. So you can throw $300 million at a movie. And if you're not emotionally invested, your eyes glaze over because yeah. you have no kind of investment in the story. And so for me... What I try to do is everybody asks me, like, what makes my action different? And I've been called old school. Well, call me old school. I'm good with that because I'm going to do it for real yeah. because I want my action to feel authentic as the, as the world that I'm trying to inhabit. But the most important thing is how you get there. And it's allowing the, the audience to invest in characters. So when the character goes through these moments, they're either feeling the heroics of the moment, mm -hmm. they're feeling the adrenaline rush, they're feeling the fear, the anxiety, but they're in the action in a way that they're immersed into it and they're participating in it yes. versus just watching it. And that's very important to me. Absolutely. And, you know, it, the way to get that across, if I can be so bold, is to cast these films really well. And as we mentioned mm. already, Jar Butler and Naveed, but you've got an incredible cast with Nino Toussaint White, Travis Fimmel, who some people have known from Vikings mm. and Raised by Wolves. And for me, the standout, 
Ali Fazal, who was in mm. Furious 7, and of course, we got Fast X coming out this week as we're recording this, and Victoria and Abdul and Death on the Night. What a fantastic actor in this film. He really, and I mean, Navid is incredible, but for me, Ali is the standout. He's just so cool and interesting and just a Lothario in a way, but also knows how to handle his business. So what was it like balancing working with all those actors and how enriching was that for you as a director, a, 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 an international cast, so to speak? Yeah. The interesting thing about it is the movies obviously in multiple languages too. Yeah. And the last time I checked, I don't really speak Urdu or Dari or Pashto and, you know, in Farsi, so I had to rely on performance only. Like I didn't worry about the words. The words can never be the crutch. The, the emotions and the performance had to be in through the expression and through the eyes right. and the gestures of what was what was being conveyed. And the once Jerry and I came on, the movie was banked in a way that it allowed me to go search for the best actors around the world. And I really wanted to not give you the familiar faces that we see in every single Western movie mm -hmm. because they happen to be the only two or three actors that are based in Los Angeles. I wanted to go <laughs> out there and show you different faces and different looks of people. Yeah. Ali Fazal is a huge star in Mumbai. Um, and I always saw the Cahill character as the mirror to Tom Harris, right? He, the oh, hunter yeah. and the hunted. Today, one is the hunter and one is the hunted. Tomorrow, it could flip in a heartbeat. Right. And I wanted that kind of uh, that familiarity with the two, the two men, this nomadic feel, but from different points of view mm -hmm. and both looking for different ways and different outcomes. And Ali is just one of these guys that's just all in, just like Bahadur Falati and Vasilius and all the different people that we had in this movie. It's just everybody like we live in a day and age where we go to these areas to shoot because of tax incentives and half the people you know, they're into the movie, but they're just looking at what's next on the employment and then get back to their, their homes. But you didn't go to Saudi Arabia for a tax incentive. You went to be a part of something. We brought 450 people, 25 countries, wow, all races, all denominations of, of religion, both genders. And it was this huge melting pot that I think spoke to what is going on in the Middle East, what's going on around the world, yeah. that we all see each other as aliens until we understand we're not so far apart and we're not that much, we're not that different. Yeah. And so that was a really big part of it for me with this movie was showing how the different landscape of how we end up calling Latin America one thing. And we don't realize that, no, they're all individual countries yeah. and they're all individual regions within countries. And the middle East is not all one thing. They are very unique and unique countries with their own face, their own um, culture, their own DNA. And we wanted to kind of show you some of that to really kind of differentiate it. Yeah, I mean, I love that, uh, what you just said. I mean, I'm the son of Bolivian immigrants to this country. So for me, you know, mm -hmm. the, all the different, all of the Latin countries are different in their approaches and their styles and the way they speak. The language. So that does come through here in this movie, how you're able to convey that for all these different people in that region and in, in the Middle East and all those different countries that you have this movie go through. You mentioned earlier that the film was shot in Saudi Arabia. It's exclusively the first film that was shot in Alalula and uh, Jeddah. So... 450 people that must have been quite an undertaking what did you find so enriching uh and joyous about shooting in saudi arabia the interesting thing that's going on in saudi arabia is we got a snapshot an accelerated snapshot of what's been going on in the middle east for a long time and it's the idea of the ultra conservative movement that is trying to keep everything the way it's been for hundreds of years work pray sleep nothing else no culture nothing else in your life. Women are demeaned. They are not given any form of responsibility at all, right? And then there's this new uh, movement of the younger generation that doesn't want that life anymore. And they want yeah. culture. It's why you're seeing the Green Party, the, the Green Party rise in Iran. You're seeing the, yeah. the, the, um, the, the uprisings in Pakistan. And in Saudi Arabia, they're not uprisings. What's interesting about Saudi Arabia is 75% of the population is under 35 years old. So massive wow. swing. Wow. So in yeah. 2018, when they started Vision 2030, which was about bringing culture to the to the kingdom, yeah. we got to live it in real time. We saw the culture changing thing. Half of my workforce were women. You go to the air, you go wow. to the airport. Half of the um, people in the airport are women. Thirty to forty percent are not covered up. The ones that are covered up are are only because of their religious right. backgrounds, not because of politics, not because of, there aren't religious police anymore. So it was a really extraordinary experience because the movie speaks to that a lot, right? You have 
a Pakistani agent who is meeting with the Taliban in complete traditional garb. And he walks out and suddenly he's got Gucci sunglasses on, yeah. smoking a vape pen, listening to hip hop. Yeah. And that's not a caricature. That's real. That's really going on in the Middle East. And so it was really, it was a fun thing to have that many people in front of the camera and behind the camera experience it in real time and then contribute that to the movie itself. Yeah. And that certainly comes through. There's an authenticity to it as well. You know, you, you, your films have this. How can I say this manly rough edge to them, but they're always about something, you know what I'm saying? And I think mm. that's what's so great about your movies. You know, I grew up in the eighties and nineties. You were a stuntman. In a lot of films I yes, watched sir. growing up that made me fall in love with the films, but some of them could, you know, some like the, you know, the fifth installment goes right into the DVD bin. Your films are not that there's so much more amidst the action amidst the man stuff. There's so much emotion and vulnerability and conversation. And certainly in this film, you don't shy away from some of the political themes, some of the stuff that's going, what you just mentioned uh, through, this so for all the cool action sequences and badassery there's also really genuine conversations about what's going on in the changing political landscape in the movie that i think is an it's almost like a lesson for someone who might think be thinking they're going into just an awesome action film which it is but mm -hmm. it's also a, a lesson to teach you about that region and that area as well look i think i probably would have been an investigative journalist in another, in another <laughs> lifetime I love that. I love history. Right. But I'm also fed up just like everybody else with the opinions of our press now, right? We're into the whole press has become an op-ed versus giving me the facts and then letting me form my own opinion. Right. And I hope that comes across in my movies. I'm not giving you my opinion. I don't want to preach to you. I don't want to give you any of my, of, of my own subjectivity of it. Yeah. I want you to just go in and I'm going to give you an arena warts and all so that you can look at it and go man i didn't know that about yeah. that but you can take your own interpretation of how you feel about it and yeah. that's very important to me is when i did shot collar and fell and everybody asked me so what do you think prison reform is i'm like i have no idea that's not my job my job is to show you that violence breeds violence yeah and but it's a necessary evil to incarcerate people that are doing heinous things yeah. in society how do you deal with that now get you know because if we can have debate and conversation, that's how change happens. Change doesn't happen because I'm preaching to you, John, about what I think my agenda is. Right. That's the world we live in now, and it's a shame. That's a fair point, man. I mean, I, I know I went into a half-hour wormhole after I watched your movie exploring <laughs> the differences between Taliban and ISIS for a critical scene in your film. I was like, wait, wh what is the difference here? And that yeah. kind of inspired me to go and look and explore some more for sure. Uh, if just we going back to the film here with Kandahar. It's overall, I also sense that there is a bit of a commentary, not not judgmental, just a commentary about these larger forces and how they can affect people on the ground, whether it's the CIA or Afghan warlords or the press exposing things or the CIA. You know, we're seeing these large entities affect people on the ground. And if there's anything that seems to be connecting people more and more is this feeling like we're being forgotten with these large moving pieces above us. Is that something that was intentional or something that you kind of discovered as you were doing the film? I think it's in between. Well, I'm just reading I don't, it. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it was intentional. I think yeah. it, I think it was, I think it's all, I think it took care of itself oh, okay. because it's the truth. It's okay. the truth is I guess is the way I'm trying to put it. It wasn't like I was trying to give you that, that message or that lesson or, that point of view, yeah. it just is what it is. We live in a good conglomerate world now. We live in these bigger powers. And what happens is like, for example, the totalitarian regime of Iran. Yes. Well, does that make all Iranians bad people? No, that, that means that there are people that are stuck under that, under that thumb that are trying to figure out their own existence, trying yeah. to get their own values that are, are shaped differently and find their own place in life. And so I wanted to humanize yeah. all aspects of, there are powers that are dictating what we do and how we move and how we navigate. But that doesn't mean that we're a part of those powers. We are still individual humans. And I love that this story gives you that. It gives you the individual human story. 
That's great. Yeah. If we can, uh, and this movie comes out for those of you who don't know, this movie comes out on May 26th. This is definitely one you need to put on your calendar. I get it. We get those big tentpole action films, but an action film that actually makes you think and explores the stuff that's going on in this region of the world that is so important to the rest of the world, I think is one you should definitely put on your calendar, guys. Um, I have to move off a little bit and ask you one question. You, you directed Snitch, which is, to me, the first example that Mr. Dwayne Johnson could actually act. You got a mm -hmm. wonderful performance out of him beyond just the regular action hero performance. And I got to ask you, man, he I mean, Fast X is coming out. You've worked with Dwayne Johnson before. Do you have any interest in exploring a Fast and Furious movie or any of these kind of uh, franchise films? Is this something that attracts you or do you like kind of carving your own path at this point with the things that you're doing? Well, first of all, I'd work with Dwayne Johnson in a heartbeat again because he's just a great human being. He is. I was going to joke and say he's a pain in the ass, but he's not. He's just a <laughs> wonderful human being. Yeah. Look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm um, set to do um, here in the near future um, the next evolution of Cliffhanger. You know, and I heard that in the wind somewhere. Yes. Yeah, and you know, for me, yeah, I'm going to do those big movies. But what's great about this version of Cliffhanger is. Stallone being such a, a a major star, but also this guy that can be so humble and yeah. pass the torch to others. The way that he passed the torch to Michael B. Jordan and Creed for the Rocky franchise, yeah. that's what can happen. Cliffhanger is you're going to meet his. He's going to pay. He's playing Gabe Walker, a continuation of the original. Mm -hmm. He has a daughter now. You know, he has another guy that works for him that's become like a pseudo son and. All hell breaks loose, but it's really about dealing with trauma. You know, tra there's a tragedy that happens in the movie, yeah. you know, that harkens back to the stuff that Gabe Walker dealt with in the original movie. Right. So for me, if I can root the audience in an emotional thrust, I'll go big or go home. Trust me, I will go big. But <laughs> it has to, there has to be an emotional integrity to me and at least some kind of point of view about it. The way Mike Banning and Angel Has Fallen was a big summer popcorn yeah. action movie. But we gave you a little bit about adrenaline addiction. We gave you why Tom Brady didn't hang up the boots. You know, the <laughs> we gave right. we gave you why those things are because it's not just mm. law enforcement or soldiers, but anybody that deals, um, you know, defying their own mortality. We're all we're all guilty of it. And so, if there's a little bit of something that we take away from a movie, I'm all in. But I, you know, if I can take if I can have Nick Nolte blow up half the damn forest and and beat <laughs> Apocalypse, now I'm in. So. I have that in 4K, brother. I mean, I love that movie. <laughs> you did such a great job with that. I love your work, man. That's why it was such a gift for me to be able to have uh, some minutes with you to talk about your work and your stuff. And one last question. How far along are you? You mentioned the cliffhanger, re a reboot or requel or whatever the kids are calling mm -hmm. it nowadays. What? Do, how far along are you on this with the script from Mark B. and Cooley? Where are you on this? Uh, oh, is it already done? Are you all... Set we're just do? no we're just we're just at the starting blocks right now okay. and building it out and you know i would say that it's it's fun that i'm going to be doing cliffhanger and you know we will be doing the sequel to greenland as well which yeah. is right. going to be fun because it's going to be the continuation of the same story i mean i wish we were an ip like dune where i could have shot them together yeah but it is a two-parter very much like dune the way the first movie took you to the extinction event the second movie will show you what happened after the extinction event. Yeah. Did they survive? Who survived? How did they actually rebuild the earth and continue cool. forward? I think the big thing for me um, that I've been really thinking a lot about lately coming out of the pandemic is our theatrical landscape has really changed. You know, yeah. I've been joking that I'm against this big action hero on World Day Weekend, you know, The Little Mermaid. Yeah. And But the <laughs> thing is, though, they're these really, really, really big movies and we need those. Yeah. But for the people that love the adult driven movies, the action movies and so forth, yeah. we need to get to the theaters and support these movies before the only place we see them is streaming. Yeah. We're in a very dangerous place right now where we used to be the number one at the, at the box office, but we are now the underdogs. And I love these movies. I love making these movies. I love to find unique stories and angles that I don't need all the tropes and so forth. Cause I spent $200 million, but we need the audience to kind of put grab some popcorn and come out and have fun on World Day weekend and on, and then we can keep making these things and make them theatrical, and that that's really important. That's I miss that. My wife and I we go to our date night is to go sit in the theater and go watch and explore, and we love it. And so hopefully people will take have, you know find their way to the theaters on this.
I think they are, right? Because, I mean, this is – you see already the articles coming about about the death, the, quote, death of streaming because people mm -hmm. do want to go back to theaters. People do want to be in there, and they want to have multiple selections. So hopefully, from your lips to God's ears, it does happen, and we see this coming back more and more in our theaters uh, for sure. Uh, which yes, is sir. Great. Can I uh, say one last thing? Rick, please. Well, well, you talk about the searchers. This is the Outlaw Nation inspired by Westerns. I think a Western by Rick Romanois down the road – would be awesome to see. I see elements of it in a lot of your films. A full-on western, I think, would be fantastic for me. Just a little suggestion. Just well, I just I just gave you the pale rider and the and the dark horse guy, except he was on a KTM motorcycle in the Arabian <laughs> Desert. But, <laughs> but yes, sure. trust me, I am. There are two. There are two arenas that I've been just trying to find the right vehicle. One is a western. Yes. There's no question about a frontier movie. Awesome. And the other one is I really want to do a big historical epic. I want my gladiator. I want my big, my brave heart. You yeah. know, um, I want I want to do something big and historical. I'd be that's a that's a dream. There you go. And, and maybe a little romantic comedy to kind of offset some things. Who knows? Maybe. Now you're you've been talking to my wife. I see she wants me to do. <laughs> she wants more romantic comedies. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> all right well, ladies and gentlemen that has been rick roman wall the film is coming out gandahar on may 26th put it on your calendars trust me this is a damn good film and a damn good performance by everybody including gerard butler in this one thank you rick we appreciate the time thank you john i appreciate you bud mm -hmm.